Hi everybody, this is Angela Savage, the daughter of IndyCar driver Swede Savage. It's time to watch stories from motorsports. My buddy, Doug Kenny, loves to share the journey of people in racing, and he is an amazing dude. Drivers, owners, fans, and team members, watch the SFM podcast. Hey everybody, this is Doug Kenny from Stories from Motorsports. I'd like to thank my buddy Josh May for the YouTube work he did years ago that inspired me to create this platform. I'd like to thank my buddy Victor Sifton for convincing me to get back into it after my hiatus from 2017 to 2019. I have a very special treat for you all today with an amazing journey from an amazing racing figure. Driver, start your engines! Hey everybody, this is Doug Kenny from Stories from Motorsports, and today we have Mr. Robbie Unser with us. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you doing, Doug? Doing fabulous. Where are you at at the moment? Uh, home, actually, so Albuquerque, New Mexico. Nice, that's where the Unsers originate, is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so what got you into racing? <laughs> Uh, there wasn't really a choice um, <laughs> the way I came in, but, uh, well, as you know, I mean, obviously I come into a family of it, so um, that's what we did when we were kids. Um, I will say that I enjoyed it a lot, uh, more so, I think, the working on the cars, building cars, making cars go faster, and that kind of stuff. Uh, driving was fun, but I really did enjoy uh, fabricating in that side of the business more. But nevertheless, um, that was it. I mean, first time I was exposed to a go-kart, I was like four, so. Yeah, it looks like you were born about a few months before your father, Bobby, won his first Indy 500. Yep, well, yeah. Yep, yep, beginning of that year, so. You probably wouldn't have remembered at that age, probably, but what do you remember about 1975 when your dad won his second? Uh, so, you know, we didn't go, I wasn't there, um, so I'm going to say those early, one time we went to the Speedway earlier than, say, 10 years old, 11 years old, my sister and I. Uh, my grandfather took us, our grandfather took us, my mom's father, uh, and we went back a year. Actually, that would have been after that. That was in 81, so we were already, or 79 or 80. It was before his 81 win. So 75 was on the radio. Um, don't remember much of it. I remember gathering around the radio for live because it wasn't televised back then live. Uh, later, soon after that, then it was on TV, and just watching it and listening to it. So that was kind of it. We didn't go. We went to Phoenix some. Um, that was pretty much it. But we did not go to a lot of my dad's races, you know, that young, until about in the 80s when I got to be, you know, a bit older. Got it. So yeah, he won for Dan Gurney, and that was an that was an amazing race. It looked like because he was able to drive basically on what had become a lake. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it was a shortened race. Um, obviously, one of the uh, one of the shortened races. So um, competitive race. They were a good car, from what I remember. Um, so I don't remember it live, but as being a history buff of the sport, I. I uh, know about the race fairly well. Um, big thing that sticks out in my head, that race was Sneva's big crash. That was uh, quite devastating. And, uh, and then the race was shortened. So uh, full of eagle offies. And um, yeah, that was it. I got more, you know, you get Uncle Al then in, in 78. Then you get 
into 79, 80 era when my dad got into Roger Penske's team, that's when I finally got old enough to actually go to some of the events. Uh, I remember being in the pits, being around Roger a lot, you know, old enough to start soaking in what was going on. That car, the 81 car, was developed a lot by my dad and his crew of guys in Albuquerque because he had a wind tunnel, uh, a flow bench, wind tunnel, flow bench, not a wind tunnel, but a flow bench. And they made uh, scaled down versions of tunnels and cars and things. And uh, that's how they came up with the aerodynamics. So um, for me, a big time in racing because that's when ground effects was coming in. Uh, you know, with the Chaparral in 1980 and and so forth. So um, a lot happening then. That's when I started actually soaking that in from my seat. I was just as busy every one of those weekends my dad was because I had to stay here and go go kart racing. You know, so I you know dad was racing, but I was really enthralled with my own career at, in those years. Yeah, that makes sense. I actually met Roger Penske a couple years ago in Nashville during the Grand Prix weekend. Yeah, good guy. Very, a very good guy, and I really love that he took over the IndyCar series. I think, I actually have said many times, and I still believe, he's the best automobile businessman since Henry Ford, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, he does a good job. Um, best time to have that business right now, and... We'll see how they navigate it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Roger's getting older, so it's a lot of other people, I think, doing it. But uh, yeah, but it's a good group of people, so high hopes there. Yeah. So yeah, I'm on to 1981, and we all know what happened in that race with your uh, dad. Um, I'm just curious, uh, what did you see during that whole several months fiasco between your dad and Mario? I'm I'm sure it had to have taken a toll on your father, knowing that he was going through all that legal stuff to try to overturn a penalty that, in his view, was wrong and in Mario's view was right. And so, what did you see out of that? It did. Um, it wasn't fun. <laughs> of course, you know, my dad was a pretty intense person um, to live with, to... Uh, the mildest way I can say that. So his normal level of RPM, we'll say, um, with that added, uh, it was interesting times. Uh, Marcia sure had it rough too. Um, it was hard for him because he did win the race. Uh, I think it was also extremely difficult because you don't know if people realize how close him and Mario actually were as friends as well. Um, you know, not a lot of race drivers, like today, they hang out a lot. Those days, you know, there were little groups. They weren't all friends. There were more rivalries than there were otherwise. And growing up, Mario was always somebody who was around a lot um, as far as a positive bad friend. You know, as kids, it was it was always them to... I mean, I still think of them as family in a lot of ways. That's just the way they were, you know. And so I think that the fact that they were fighting and that that battle was between Dad and Mario, and quite honestly, they didn't talk literally until just before he passed away. Uh, no, a few years before he passed away. But, um, you know, that, that was, I think, a big thing. Yeah, that's that's really unfortunate. And... I read a little bit of that too, and you know, honestly, this is just my opinion. You know, it's sad when that when it kind of becomes personal and it's the biggest race in the world, you know, and this is just my opinion. I think Bobby and Mario would have been better off going fishing with each other rather than fighting yeah. and ra rather than yeah. fighting in that appellate room, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it was really sad cuz I mean, <clears throat> Mario was right, but he also did the same thing. Yeah. So that, you know, is the way it ended up boiling down to is they both broke the rule. So it put them all back and they were still first and second. So, okay, there you go. 
You know what I mean? Um, it was sad that they had to do it. And my dad got really caught up in the fight and wanted to keep fighting. I mean, that was also sad. I think it, you know, there wasn't anything good came out of it, I can tell you that much. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Was that race the reason that Bobby retired, or was it other things? He says it. I think that it probably had a lot to do with it. You know, again, he was... <laughs> my father was uh, the most wound up, intense, quite honestly, narcissistic person you'll ever meet. I mean, he was just... It took a toll on every team, every relationship, everything he did. He, you know, it also made him a great race driver, right? It, it's why he had so many poles. It's why he pushed so hard. It's why he got so much out of cars. It's why engineers liked him. I mean, it was, you know, a double-edged sword. It, it, it's why he was what he was, but it came with a heavy price to anyone around him who was close, uh, as well as his car owners and, and whatnot, you know, so... Uh, he got to the point there at the end where he was really intense. And all you can do is just move forward to 82 where he ran the team for Jose de Garza. You know, I mean, that that kind of showed where he was with his racing and it was too much. Honestly, the best thing I think my dad did was move into the broadcasting. Because there it wasn't where he was, you know, Bobby Hunter and he could do whatever he wanted any way he wanted because, you know, no one could tell him no. I think he took it on as a new challenge. He was trying to learn. It was something new. He was somebody who tried to, you know, do the best at whatever he did. And he was surrounded by good people, Paul Page and, and others, that I think he sought more of learning from them. Therefore, those relationships were... Good. And he was still a character, according to them, as well. But, you know, with the racing, I think it got to the point where his intensity was almost unhealthy for what was going on, as well as the way it was going, you know, in racing. I mean, don't forget that one of the most famous stories is that, I believe, talking McGee and, and all of his guys into marking the springs and all of the stuff and Penske wrong so that when he shared his setups you know Rick didn't have his setup <laughs> <laughs> I mean these are the antics that went on you know boy would I love to sit down with a coffee a tea at Rick Mears and say okay I've heard him say so many times that Bobby Unser taught him more than anybody else but not by actually you know sitting down and telling him anything right mm-hmm I mean, can you imagine what those antics were? Because first off, they were antics. I mean, you're talking about guys that came up, you know, Howard Milk and my dad. I mean, they were always playing jokes on each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was first and foremost. Not to mention there was this competitiveness that I'm sure those two lines were blurred quite often, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So um, I can only imagine. I do know that I, well, I've never driven for Roger myself, but I hear that at least Al Jr. said when he got there, most of his introductory in, introduction to Penske was basically he called it the Bobby Unser speech and what not to do and how he won't be doing things this way anymore. <laughs> you know. And again, that's my dad. So poor Rick, uh, between either joking with him, messing with him, or just trying to make sure he didn't have to do it and deal with him, he had that. And then on the other hand, you have a guy that pushed the team in a way, as Roger says, and really developed these cars. I mean, you can honestly say that my dad, Kenya there with, uh, with Roger and the team, they really did develop some amazing vehicles and, and stuff out of that. So, um, yeah, that was my dad. It was interesting. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please hit like and subscribe if you did so, and um, please continue supporting our amazing guest. 
And everybody, we'll see you next time on SFM. Hi, this is Ted Warner speaking. While the checkered flag has waved for this program, stay tuned for next week for the next episode of SFM. Thanks to Doug Kenny for what he does for motorsports.